again, everyone. And now to the really exciting bit of the evening. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I'm very, very thrilled to announce that we have, as I announced earlier on, two of the uh, principal members of the crew behind this, not just Nick B. Carr, who wrote the music for both films um, and co wrote the songs, including the song you just heard, Who Will Love Me Now, sung by PJ Harvey, but as well as his co writer on that song and the writer and director of the films, Philip Ridley. Will you please give a huge round of applause as we welcome to the stage? I mean, where to start? There's so much to discuss with both of these films, but I suppose we should sort of start sort of nearer the beginning. Phil, tell us a bit about how you kind of how, because we all, I think a lot of us know about your theatre work, but in terms of your film work, because obviously you wrote the original the screenplay for The Craze sort of just before you made The Reflecting Skin. Can you just give us a bit of background for, um, how you know you got into film and how the hell did you get a film like both of these funded? I mean, let alone The Reflecting Skin as well, since it's hard to imagine either of them getting made nowadays. Dramatic pause. <laughs> oh, the lead's not long enough for me, no. <laughs> Nick, you'll have to deal with the stuff. <laughs> That's better. Um, just uh, the, the reflecting skin was shot before the craze. Oh, was it? I made the reflecting skin before the craze happened by four weeks. Because it, 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 what you've just said about how on earth did this get funded. That's exactly what I was thinking, sitting at the back, <laughs> watching it. Um, I thought, how, how did I get money? Because obviously the climate in which we're making films now, that, can you imagine turning up? I mean, the money for the reflecting skin, a third, a third of it came from the BBC. Can you imagine turning up with a script? As, as bonkers as this, that opens with an exploding frog and ends with five minutes of a child screaming at sunset. Um, and then just giving you half a million pounds. <laughs> <laughs> what went on, you know? But that's exactly what happened. Um, in fact, the reflecting skin was a very, I mean, I sound awful to say it because I, you know, we all struggle ever, you know, I've struggled ever since and filmmakers do, but the finance for that came together so quick that it's breathtaking. I mean, we literally went in to the BBC who gave us half a million, we went into British Green three days later who said, well, if the BBC are in, we're in, here's another half a million. <laughs> And I just thought, oh, this is what filmmaking is like. <laughs> you just go into offices and you ask for half a million pounds and they give it to you. Um, I think looking back, though, to be serious for a second, there was a... Obviously, the, the climate of making films then was very different to what it is now. In fact, it's, it, 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 there was a kind of... Uh, I don't know whether it's looking back with rose-tinted spectacles, but there was a willingness to kind of invest in filmmakers that people felt they had something to say and um, they just wanted to see the film. You know, I mean, bear in mind, it's, it's, it's hard to believe, but you know, the, the Reflecting Skin was a, a primarily a screen two film. So it was primarily ma made for television. Um, that it then had a cinema release after that was a kind of head of steam that the film developed. Um, and what happened was, I just mentioned this briefly because it's probably completely boring to everyone except me, um, but the film was accepted into the Cannes Film Festival and so we kind of did the prints to get it out to the Cannes Film Festival and within 10 minutes of the first screening which was that they only put on one screening to begin with in this small little cinema. And when the exploding frog moment happened, 50% um, of the audience left. They just got up and left. And they went in to see the film that was on in the cinema next door. But what happened was that the word spread around 
uh, Le Croisette that, oh, there's something really interesting or whatever going on in this film. And so even though we lost 50% of the audience in that first screening, they then had to put on three or four extra screenings to, um, to satisfy the number of people that then wanted to see it. And after the first screening, I was coming out and there was the film critic for one of the big French newspapers, like Le Monde or something, and he came up to me and he grabbed me by the lapel and he said, not your film, a déjà un cult. Your film is already a cult. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of, that built up and then Miramax bought it for America. Um, and there was a kind of head of steam that you sometimes get, in, I mean, it's, <laughs> the head of steam finished when the film came out. I must, <laughs> it was a head of steam before release. Um, but it's something that happens in film that I, I, I haven't really experienced in any other art form where that starts to happen. Does that answer? I, I forget what your question was. What was <laughs> I just had that prepared answer. <laughs> uh, one of the other, one of the other things I find really interesting about not just the reflecting skin, but both of the films, is that even though they're set in America, which is kind of outside your comfort zone anyway, in terms of it's not the East End of London, um, neither of them were filmed in America. Um, the reflecting skin was filmed in Canada, and the Passion of Dali Moon was filmed in Germany. Um, I just wonder if you could tell us a bit about kind of the shooting of both films in terms of and you know uh, why kind of you've never gone back to America or why you've kind of just basically why these films are so distinct and so different in that way. Yeah, um, just part of that answer is how the reflecting skin came together, which I'll just talk about very quickly. Um, I wrote the reflecting skin while the, the, the ideas of the reflecting skin started when I was at art school. I studied painting at St. Martin's School of Art. And part of the stuff that I was doing at St. Martin's was I was doing kind of strange montage oil paintings of my vision of America. Uh, because I grew up reading American novels like Stephen King and pulp comics and Ray Bradbury and um, Robert Block, all who wrote the original Psycho, just to tie it all in with the trailer. Um, so I, I was kind of reading all these people, and I like and I love the iconography of America, like Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley is the image of Elvis Presley has run almost through everything that I've done. You know, you can spot the black quiff. You know, there's one in uh, Reflecting Skin, obviously with Bigo when he comes, and then Darkly Moon's got a black quiff. So this kind of all these kind of Americana, and I was doing all these paintings of. Uh, American, and I called them American Gothic. There were about 50 of these paintings. And uh, a friend of mine said, they look like a film. They look like you've been doing a storyboard for a film. Because it was golden wheat fields, and it was these kind of satanic children and all of that. And I thought, oh, that's, yeah, perhaps there is a film. So actually the reflecting skin was really written from image to image. I had these kind of images that I wanted to reach and I kind of found this kind of strange story that kind of linked those together. So that came out of that and the passion of Darkly Noon came from doing the reflecting skin because when I was doing the reflecting skin we were very near a religious community. I don't know whether it was an Amish community or whatever but you would see them kind of in these kind of black robes and not robes black outfits, um, robes, <laughs> where was I living? Um, but you saw them in these black clothes and they kind of were um, hyper-religious. They look much, in the reflecting skin, they look much more like the Joshua character that was the father of Seth that comes in who's a bit mad they had those kind of hats on. And I thought, and I remember thinking at the time, uh, because the reflecting skin was sort of like set in that kind of community, what if somebody escapes from that kind of community and is then driven mad by the world around him, by what he's got, by his set, by his kind of um, senses, really. And I thought that's kind of quite an interesting fable about fundamentalism, you know, that, um, and it's kind of, it's, it's very interesting, I think, now to see Darkly Noon post 9-11 and in what we're living through, that it, it looks much more like a fable about that than it ever did before. I was sitting there thinking, God, it really is just a kind of fairy tale about religious fundamentalism. It's kind of, it has all the tropes of a fairy tale. But they came out of that kind of art school thing. And um, I kind of haven't gone back to that since, really. 
Um, so my next question is for Nick. Um, Nick, obviously these two films were kind of your most prominent collaborations with Phil, but you've gone on to collaborate with him many times since, not just in the songs for Heartless, Phil's most recent film, um, but also music for some of the stage plays like the Pitchfork Disney and um, one of the songs in Tenzin Napalm. Could you tell a bit about how you became involved in The Reflecting Skin and how your working relationship with Phil and kind of how it's evolved through the years and through the different projects? Yeah, um, I think Phil had seen a film I'd done music for, David Herfin called Weatherby, and he asked me to, to um, come and see the cut of Reflecting Skin, because uh, he was interested in muddying music. I didn't know his work, I didn't know anything about him, and um, I actually think I think I met you for the first time at the screening, I so. and I sat down and watched this extraordinary film. Um, I was absolutely stunned by it, really. I'd never seen anything like it before. It was quite frightening. Um, to contemplate, because I approach film music in a very uh, emotional way and I have to take the story to heart and try and express it and tell, tell the story of the musical narrative in quite a sort of traditional way really. Um, uh, I knew it was a very daunting thing to approach. But anyway, uh, we did that, we did that and uh, at the end of it, I think I I'd felt that I'd been working on reflecting scene with the director who left the space for the music and understood what music could do and that music was not inferior to text and had its own place in the narrative. And I was kind of tired of doing music for films where it was assumed that the text carried every single message of the story and every single message of emotion. Um, and it was a breath of fresh air to be able to write music which could stretch out in those places and interplay with the spoken scenes and had its own narrative waves and uh, ebb and flow and undertow. Um, we talked about what we'd done afterwards and then um, decided that the next film we should we should have a song. Um, and in fact we started writing Who Will I Me mean Now long before you made the film, didn't we? Mm. Um, and uh, the other song Look what you've done to my skin. I think we also started that before, before you'd done the film. We also decided that uh, because Phil felt very strongly that music should have a prominent place, he was interested in the idea of having music before shooting. And after reading the script and talking about it and writing these songs, I wrote some pieces of music, about half an hour's worth of music, which I recorded, which was thematic and wasn't really structured to any particular scenes or counts of minutes and seconds but they were moves associated with Cali, with Darkly, and with the general idea of the story. And you took them with you to shoot, didn't you? You had them available for the actors on the set and to use them whilst you were shooting and actually cut to them. And then I revised the, um, the music after the cut based on those first ideas. So a huge amount of the flow of the film was influenced by the music and that was really exciting to do. So we did these two songs and felt that the, the way they carried the narrative was interesting and the idea of putting in threads of the melody of Who Will Love Me Now and the lyric seeded throughout the film. It was an interesting idea. And only paying it off at the end. Um, and I uh, decided that writing songs was good fun. We wanted to do some more of them. And we wrote quite a lot of songs from that moment on. I'm currently in the middle of a well, nearly finished a song cycle which is based on the heroines of Grimm's fairy tales and their points of view of the story. Which are fairly strange songs. And they're going to yeah. perform fairly soon. You have a project called Dream Screen, Dreamskin Cradle, which is a collection of songs. We are Dreamskin. <laughs> <laughs> so that, Whenever we, we do bad. anything, it's just words and music. Dreamskin Dream Cradle. Dream Skin cradle yeah. <laughs> we are Dreamskin Cradle. <laughs> yeah, I'm available on iTunes and all the other good music vendors, so check it out. Very good. Um, I suppose the big elephant in the room as well as the casts in the film, of course, Viggo Mortensen being in both films, and then of course Lindsay Duncan, who's amazing in The Reflecting Skin, but then you have Brendan Fraser and Ashley Judd, just before, you know, just before all of these people kind of became huge stars as well, kind of appearing in these films. Could you kind of tell us a bit about working about them, particularly with Viggo, since obviously he's in both films. So he's someone who obviously you have a kind of tre uh, treasured collaboration with. Well, Viggo, um, I went to, when we were doing The Reflecting Skin, um, I went to Los Angeles to cast um, the American actors that we were going to cast from there. And I think, from what I remember, this was a long time ago now, but from what I remember, Vigo came in to see me to play the driver of the Cadillac, from what I remember. And he came in and just 
blew me away. I mean, it's kind of one of those moments you pray for, really, when you just go, God, this guy is incredible. Um, and I said to the casting director, well, look, you know, he's got to play the brother in this. And that was it, really. It's kind of, it's always strange when people say, how did you cast this person? Because I'm sure you're expecting some mystical, ruining story about how I kind of slayed goats. And, and actually, they just walked into the room. And I just said, they're good. <laughs> They've got the part. That's how you cast. There's nothing more. It's luck, really, that you're there when someone comes in, um, when they're like that. And Vigo and I um, worked very closely on the reflecting skin, because not just in the terms of obviously making the film, but kind of talking about um, how to approach this tone that the film had to have, because it's you know it's a dream it's a fantasy in a way it's my dream of america it's a fable it's a fairy tale and yet it still has to be emotionally true it still has to feel right even though there's huge leaps of logic in it and things you know deliberately don't make sense in a kind of logical way but they make sense in a dreamscape way and you, that takes a lot of plotting and a lot of working out so that even though intellectually you're knowing it shouldn't go that way you're emotionally willing to buy it going that way and that takes a lot of work with the actors because it's all about tone it's all about them just hitting exactly the right tone when they come into the scene that they can make you believe that and um, all the actors in the reflecting skin um, were like that they could just come in and just believe it 100%. I mean, just absolutely, Lindsay could just come in and just play those lines like they were Chekhov, <laughs> you know, just kind of absolutely believe them and deliver them with everything that she had. And so hopefully we as an audience believe them too. And uh, my last question, just before we uh, give it to, over to the audience to ask questions, um, to ask questions, sorry. Um, Passion of Darkly Noon just said, stylistically, the second half of the film is so kind of phenomenally interesting in terms of the way it kind of formally collapses almost in the same time that uh, Darkly Noon goes mad. Um, could you tell us a bit about that process in terms of the fast cutting, in terms of what uh, putting that together, particularly since this was this kind of pre-digital age that you were making the film as well? Well, the, the way... All three films... I've done another film after this called Heartless, and all fit three films are kind of share something which is trying to create film as a psychological state each each one is the way that i've made the film is the psychological state of the lead character in the film so um we see the fit in reflecting skin we see the story through seth dubs this eight nine year old boy we see the film entirely through his eyes so the camera is very rarely beyond the level of a child it's always a child's eyes so everything is being seen through a child it's also is it the child um is it the child seeing that seeing it or is it the adults as uh, the adult of that child is it the remembrance of that childhood and it's kind of the psychological state of the reflecting skin is that it might it is probably seth as an old man now remembering his childhood and he's conflated it as this completely operatic over-the-top fantastical fairy story where all the colors are saturated and all the noises are loud and not quite as loud as in the print you saw but still, <laughs> still fairly loud um, and, and the music is kind of you know very intensely emotional and operatic and on its sleeve because our childhoods are like that, you know, our childhoods are spent in this endless summer where everything is vivid and real. And he might well have come, kind of put together the events of three or four summers and ended up with this story that we've got. Um, and Darkly Noon is, is the psychological state, obviously, of the Brendan Drazen character. So we, we had to meticulously kind of work that out because the, the budget was minimal I mean no money at all and I lost the first <laughs> the loans of a director now, but I lost the first weeks 
shooting on Dark Pinoon because of weather and um, three or four other disasters. So I, was, I went into it a week behind. Um, so everything had to meticulously be worked out. So I did this kind of graph of how we move from tripods and tracking and steady cam through handheld and how it was going to be edited in the end. I mean, the, the, the scene, for example, where Darkly's begun to lose it and he's kind of in the foreground of the frame doing some work on a piece of wood and Vigo is in the background um, and he's kind of jump cutting backwards and forwards. Um, that was kind of worked out beforehand and we really only had time to sort of like do those moments. So it was like, okay, just run, now run back. <laughs> Two bits of chip, now run forward, quick. And, and, and you know, you, I, I wouldn't want anyone to see the little bits in between of people <laughs> running backwards and forwards. But it had to be done at that speed because the last, the last reel and a bit, the last Wrath of, the, the, the Wrath of God finale, if you like, has more cuts in it. At least it did at that time. It doesn't now because everyone edits on Avid and you can do it very quickly. But it had more cuts in it than the average Hollywood feature film in that last section where, where Dark Noon starts to attack the house. And to edit that quick, as we were doing on that budget, um, to edit that fast, I mean, it's a testament to the editor, Leslie Healy, who was just absolutely fantastic. I mean, that is phenomenal editing to have done on a steam back, you know, where you're working with tiny little bits of film, and it's like the shower scene of Psycho extended to 20 minutes long. And that's it. And it, the, the only reason I keep saying the budget is because it, it's not that it costs a lot of money to do the actual, but it's time. It's very time consuming, and you pay for an edit suite by the day. So that is very time consuming. I mean, I would walk into the edit suite where Leslie was working, and there would be thousands hanging up on crocodile clips, just thousands of tiny little bits of film. You know, just some, some, of the, some of the bits are just five or seven frames long. And all of that had to be assembled and you know, redone and redone until we got it down to that. So it was, it was an ambitious last 20 minutes, really. Can we take uh, questions from the audience now? Anyone have any questions? Uh, I'm intrigued by the way you name your things. Risk of being pertinent, would you mind talking a bit about how you come up with these names like Darkly Noon and Mercury Fur? Search everywhere to see <laughs> Mercury Fur. Well, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, um, the question was about the naming of things and um, the naming of the character Darkly Noon and the name of a stage play that I've done called Mercury Fur, which. Uh, two different things in the way that they're named, so I have to kind of talk about them in different ways, really. Um, I did go through a phase where I used to name my characters very baroquely, as you've just witnessed. Um, I don't really do it anymore, <laughs> uh, but I used to do it. The, the, the reason I did it was to escape the English curse of realism which has destroyed most of art in many ways and is a, is a kind of, you know... Oh God, where do I start? You know, it's, it's, you know, we just love realism. You know, it's so real. You know, and what is real? You know, no one knows what's real. It's, oh, it's so realistic. It's so, oh, we love it. It's so naturalistic. As if that in itself is meretitious. You know, and of course it's not. You only have to look at the films they thought were realistic from the 50s to realise just how arch they were. You know, getting on the bus, let me, come on, get on the... You know, my God, no one talked like that then. <laughs> and then well, so, so this, this concept of realism, and because I was doing something that was kind of more fabulism in a way, say for, say for example the first two films here, not so much um, Heartless, the one I did recently, but definitely these two films. It's a way of trying to let the audience in to say, look, don't sit there thinking that you're watching, you know, something of a realistic nature. I'm trying to do something else. I'm trying to create a kind of um, dreamscape of a reality that for me makes much more sense than um, what you refer to as realism. So if I started to call the characters like In Reflecting Skin, if I started to call them Seth Dove, 
then you know that hopefully sets up a, um, a, a preconception from an audience of what they should expect. They're not going to sit there and watch a documentary or something. You know, it, it would have been different if I'd called the boy, you know, Cliff, whatever. You know, it would kind of. You, but so it's a way of being, and it, it's kind of it amazed me because the, this this always caused a lot of um, talk in the press about me call rock, but it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a tradition that goes back. I mean, Tennessee Williams is full of, full of it, Dickens is full of it, of course. I haven't, got, I haven't gone quite so far as calling a butcher Mr. Cutty Meat, <laughs> as Dickens did, but um, that's, not, that's not saying I won't at some point. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a big bit, it's a way of, it's a way of just letting the audience in to how to perceive what they're doing. Um, and I haven't really done it because the, that kind of extreme fabulism has tended to kind of be slightly um, leavened out uh, in, in, in some more recent work. But I think that's why it's kind of to try and prepare you for how to, I mean, that's what we need to do, you know, that, that, that's our big job as artists really, is how to, how do we prepare an audience to try to experience what we want to give them in the way that we think it should be experienced. And any little clue you can give about, you know, it's not that, it's this. It's not that, it's this. It's usually telling them what it's not. You know, if you gradually tell them what it's not, then what's left is what? What is real? Um, does that explain it to a certain extent? It doesn't explain what Mercury Fur means, but. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes. Katie? Um, for those that are in here, it's just about, um, because I work in different media, it's just what comes first, the idea or the way it should be presented. And um, it usually happens at exactly the same time. I, I, I very, I've, I've been asked this a lot, and it's very rarely, I think, that I've sat down and thought, well, I've got this idea for something, but should it be a film? Should it be a painting? Or? It, it Usually what it is... Um, the story, how you want to tell the story, dictates the medium that it's going to be told in. So, for example, the reflecting skin, yes, it was based, some of the images are based on paintings, but what we've just seen, that has to be a film. There's no other way, there's no other way that that would, it's obviously not a stage play. Um, it's not, it wouldn't work successfully as a novel because the images have to be so specific that unless everyone's completely tuned in to what I'm doing. So that has to be a, that has to be a film. Um, and if you think of an idea where I'm seeing people telling each other what's going on and what they're feeling with words, then that's usually a stage play. You know what I mean? It's kind of, I mean, there's certain things that you can do in one medium that you can't do in another. And I'm very, I've always been very particular and hopefully proud of the fact that whatever I'm doing is very particular to that medium, that the stage plays aren't just things I couldn't get made into films. You know, they're particular, they are stage plays and they have to be, they have to be stage plays. And it's very interesting kind of working with uh, a lot of younger writers as I do now, trying to get them to realize what is a, a visual language that should really belong on a, 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 a verbal and visual language that is film or a visual a, a verbal language that is theater or something that's a novel and once you kind of start getting that then i think you kind of your writing gets much clearer about where where you're going you know i always say to people that a good example of that is a scene that has to be for example, in a novel, and you could never do as a stage play or never do as a, as a film, is something like, Phoebe walked into the party. It was full of people. But the middle-aged man in the corner of her, the room reminded her of her, her father. Now, that can't be a film, you know. 
Phoebe walks into the party. <laughs> Gets out a photograph of father. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, it's so internalised that that has to be a... So it's kind of, once something starts to get externalised with words, then it becomes, becomes a stage play. But I've never, I've never, so I've never been in that position where I thought, oh, I've got an idea, what should it be? It usually clicks at exactly the same moment. A supplementary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll allow you. Uh, based on that, I was just wondering, have you got anything in your repertoire that you would like to see changed into something else? So, say, Spartan Shot being a children's play. Could you, could you see that being maybe like a film or anything different? Well, there's been, with the stage plays, there's been offers to, or there's been overtures, if you like, to perhaps make them into films, and I've resisted it all up until now, um, because I think that there's something about the theatrical experience that when you film it, you've lost the most important thing, which is the audience. You know, in theatre, the most important thing, apart from obviously what you're doing on stage, is the audience. It's not theatre until there's an audience watching it then you have the alchemy of what you're doing in a dialogue with other minds and each evening you do it is different. It's why when you see a filmed version of a stage play, you know, you kind of think, I was there and it was brilliant and it looks so flat now. Was it, why does it look so... Because it's not live, you know, it's meant to be live. Um, so I've resisted it in that sense. Um, and also a lot of the stage plays that I've done have been about um, claustrophobia. They've been about the audience coming in and the door closing behind them and them feeling trapped in the space with the actors. Um, it's why, for the most part, I lost the idea of an interval in a lot of the plays. But a lot of my plays just go as real time straight through without break because I like the idea of um, the audience feeling claustrophobic, that there's no way out, because the plays themselves are about claustrophobia. Um, when we first did a play of mine called Mercury Fur that was done at the um, uh, Chocolate Factory, we even made it more difficult for the audience, because if they wanted to leave the play, they had to walk across the stage, the exit that was at the back of the stage. So they were in there and they were trapped. They couldn't get out. And I think that that is theatre. You know, cinema is different. People can come in and they can come out. But because my plays are about claustrophobia, I don't, I can't see how they can work as films. I've kind of, I, I, you know, directors have come up to me and said that they've got ideas about how, I just don't see how it can happen. The other thing, I'll just say very quickly, if I, if I may, that I'm really petrified of a definitive st statement in theatre as well. You know, the theatre is a process and I, I get a great thrill when I work with a director, either if they're doing a revival or doing something I've just done, where they come in and they interpret it. They do their vision, they do their production. And I'm very scared that if something is put in film, film becomes such a kind of set in aspic kind of thing that people might think that that has my blessing as to how it should always be done. And um, that's not the case at all. We just about have time for one more question. Um, any takers? Anyone? Question? Yes? I just wanted to ask Nick. Um, obviously, one was electronic with the two films, but um, in what way did the approach differ in writing music for the two films? Yeah, the, um, we, we decided the whole of Dark Inner would be electronic and not, not a mixture of, any, of uh, acoustic and electronic. And <clears throat> I think it is different. There's a However much you try and use uh, samples of real instruments or um, whatever you do, in the, with electronic music you're always making choices and making a selection based on your choices which becomes the composition. It's, um, it's a, a sort of construction process and you can always, I think, subconsciously hear that, whereas if you're doing an acoustic score, I think on some level the audience knows that somebody's heart was beating while they pulled the bow across the string. Their life was ebbing away while they played. <laughs> you know, whereas, somehow you know that with live music, but with electronic music you somehow know that there wasn't that particular 
theatricality, there was a sequence of choices. I think it might be a little bit like the difference between sculpting something out of clay and constructing it out of pieces of metal, like a Miro or something we'll call them. You're constructing something out of concepts that you've had, rather than having something kind of flowing and organic, which is constantly evolving. That was a big difference. And also trying to do an electronic score, which still had the, the narrative conscience of a traditional orchestral score, because I think that really suits Philip Stone. Uh, just two quick questions before we call it a night. Um, for Nick, where is the best, best place we can buy your music, including Dream Skin, Dream Skin Cave Cradle, I will say it correctly one day, and the score for The Reflecting Skin? Uh, if you just Google my name, go to my website, and either it's for sale already, or you write me on the contact tab. And I'll tell you, because I'm working on the Dark Union album at the moment, Reflecting Skin is available, but Dark Union I'm still on editing. And Philip's supposed to be coming up with images, and he hasn't yet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one last question for you, Phil. Uh, what's coming Very up? Images, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's coming up next for you? And lastly, any chance of any more films? Do you think is that something that might be on the horizon one day? Or well, the next thing I'm doing is I'm doing the um, Christmas show, the family Christmas show at Southwark Playhouse. So do come along and see that. It's called Feathers in the Snow, and it opens at the beginning of December. And it's a huge fairy tale that takes 500 years to tell. And it has a cast of 50. Uh, but expect to see three actors working very hard. <laughs> when you turn up. Um, and as for the next... Film, I don't know. I mean, I finished The Reflecting Skin and thought, no more, that's it. And then I did Darkly Noon and thought, never again, <laughs> never again. And I finished Heartless a few years ago, and after that I thought, never again, why am I doing this? So it, it kind of, it takes a while to recover, really. Um, and it takes, yeah, it takes time for the old investors to die. <laughs> and a new naive lot to come back in. So, it's a generational thing, my filmmaking, you know. So, in about 25 years, we might get another, but Philip Bigley, he makes us money, doesn't he? Oh, yes, I do, I make you lots of money. Um, so, I don't know, nothing at the moment, but definitely more stage plays. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a huge round of applause for our special guests tonight, Nick Bicar and Philip Thank you very much. Oh, you really? It's going to be the one of the best.